everybody here for a brown trout seminar? Okay. Uh, if you need, I have some notepads and some pens. If you need some, please help yourself. Um, if you want to take some notes, by all means. Yeah, yeah, I'm so fine. I run Get the Net Fishing Charters out of Kendall, New York. I'm here today to talk to you about spring trolling for browns. We're going to concentrate on trolling, especially very close to shore, early in the season. We'll talk about how the fishing, the, the setup that we use, ties into using spoons, which is primarily what we do, especially with spoons on the shoreline instead of you know stick baits, which is more customary. Uh, first of all, I start. Mike, stuff is from Warrior, was not able to be here today. I don't know if you've been walking around, his booth is really non-existent. Unfortunately, he had a death in the family and he wasn't able to come, so he apologized. But uh, there are some catalogs on the table with some coupons. If there are not enough, there's not enough, uh, by all means, please call and let them know you were at the seminar or at the show and then they'll honor. It's 20% off for any online order, so uh, he does apologize for that. Um, just a real quick question. Um, how many people are just getting into fishing as far as brown trout fishing is concerned? Okay, a couple, all right. So when we, when we go through this real quick, we'll talk about some things that, you know, we, we learned like everybody else does when you start up and you're young, some things that you can do that may save you a little bit of money as well that you know don't feel like you gotta go out and get all this crap right away because there are ways to catch browns without a ton of high-end equipment. I certainly did it. My first boat was a Starcraft Super Fisherman, and I had makeshift planer boards, and a planer board mast, and no reels, and I left the line out by hand and all this kind of stuff. So um, there's ways to do it without getting into the really the big expense of it. So what we'll do is we'll go through uh, the, some, the presentation, and then hopefully I'll try to leave like that last 10, 15 minutes uh, for questions. So if you could just hold your questions until the end, that would be that'd be fine. <coughs> Okay, so like I mentioned earlier, we're uh, sponsored by Warrior Lures, and today we're going to discuss uh, trolling for browns. Okay, our topics for discussion today are going to be when and where to fish, we're going to talk about trolling spread and techniques, spoons, the colors and sizes, and then some tips for success, and again at the end if we have questions. We can, we can run through them. Okay, when and where to fish. As soon as possible, as you guys know. Um, typically, when ice is out, late March, early April. However, with a mild winter that we've had, there's been a lot of guys that have been out in the lake trolling for browns. So there are a good amount of browns that stay in the lake and hug that shoreline and if the conditions are right, you can have your way with it. I was out January 2nd uh, with a buddy of mine who has a bass boat. I wanted to troll, he wanted to cast. We said we'll cast for a few minutes and then we'll troll. So I brought some trolling rods. Well, we caught so many fish casting. It was it was incredible. So we never ended up, you know, we were never able to troll. But but typically, you know, as soon as ice is out, which is late March, early April, and we're targeting that shoreline usually about till mid-May, but again, it, it all depends on the temperature of the water. Okay, so if it's a cold spring, there's a lot of rain, they may they may hold in there for, for a lot longer than that. Okay, we are going to target the shoreline, as I mentioned earlier. We're looking for any creek, point, or cove. 
Okay. If you take a look at this image of my boat, you can see how close we are to the shoreline. All right. We're probably in about six feet of water. So the goal is to get our lures, planer boards, as close to the shoreline as possible. The area that I fish is primarily sand. One side of it's sand and the other side is rock. Browns will hold where there's sandy water, or you know, the sandy body. The theory on that is as the sun comes up early in the spring, that water is going to warm first, okay? So we want to get really, really close to shore if we can. And the thing is, you know, you have to understand the water you're fishing. So, you know, I have a smaller boat. That's, that's the boat I charter out of. It's 21-foot hydrosports. Um, I understand the shoreline I'm fishing, so I know where to avoid and, and, and how shallow I can get. This is a good uh, illustration. So this is uh, where we fish. Uh, Bald Eagle Marine is just to the left off the screen. And this area here is Double's nose, and this is a huge cove in here, okay? So what we're doing is we're, this corner here and this corner here is a great spot to catch fish because the fish will end up holding tight against that shoreline, all right? So I set up, I come out of the creek, I'm, I'm, I'm turned right, I come this way, and when I get over to this point, I wanna work this as close as I can to shore and then come out and go back again, okay? This is an illustration of Sandy Creek. This is in Hamlin, New York, okay? So, as you saw in the previous illustration, like Bald Eagle Marina, Eagle Creek, it's really not a creek. There's very little runoff. There's really no flow out of it. But we've got the shoreline that will hold the fish. Sandy Creek, great fishery, a ton of browns, and they will come out in the spring out of the creek and they'll hold along that shoreline too. Now this whole area there, that Sandy Harbor Road, that's all beach, okay? So there's a ton of sand there. That point that you see is Newman's Point. And there have been times fishing this area where you'll get, without exaggeration, 20, 30, 40 bites, all because the fish are just piled up there, okay? Okay. This example, this is a really good example here too. This is around Equate Bay, I don't know if you guys are familiar. Great spot to fish in the spring, all right? This is Shipbuilders Point. And what a lot of guys do is they'll come out of, they'll come out of here or they'll come from the river and they'll head over to the point and they're gonna fish all this up here and ignore this entire cove, okay? So you wanna start trolling literally right at the mouth and work this shoreline up to that point again, just like I showed you before. And this is a great area, especially early, early in the spring, um, that's gonna hold, that's gonna hold fish. One second. Okay. Now you have to remember too that, you know, Wherever you fish, if the points aren't huge or they don't go out into the lake a ton, don't worry about it. Any change in the shoreline is going to hold fish. So again, like we talked about before with Bald Eagle, there's no creek, okay, but it has that beautiful bowl there that holds fish. So it's important that you pay attention to your shore, understand where the areas that they might hold fish. If you go past Sandy Creek a little bit before you get to like Latome Shoal, uh, Lighthouse Point, there's a stretch <coughs> of water that's completely flat, no fish. Very, very difficult to, ca to catch fish there. Okay, so while we're on the shoreline, we're looking for any temperature change, okay? And believe it or not, one to two, deg one to two degrees makes a difference, all right? So typically in the spring, you know, if it's early April, the lake may only be 37 degrees, 36 degrees. If you're trolling and you notice your surface temperature gauge change by one, two degrees, most likely that's where the fish are gonna hold, okay? Brown trout love 55 degree water. That's their preferred temperature. Mm -hmm. They don't have 55 degree water in, in April typically, in the season. So look for those changes in temperature because that's the area that you wanna concentrate. And, and it may be a small area. It may be, you know, 50 yards. If you troll through that and get bit, turn around 
and go back. Okay, if the water starts to get warmer, I would keep going. If it drops off, so if it goes from 37 to 38 to 39, you get a couple of bites, and then it starts to drop off again, turn around and go back to that same spot. Okay. We want to look for stained water, ideally stained water. As you guys know, in the spring, gin clear water is very difficult to fish. You can catch browns in clear water, but ideally you want stained water. The ideal color of water is what you'll see in this image. This was taken January 2nd. That green, and it might be tough to see on the white screen there, but the, the, it's almost an emerald green. And the lure, is not so bright in the water that it's spooking the fish. You probably go down about two to three feet and you really still see it and then it'll start, to, it'll start to fade away. So ideally, green water is what you're looking for. But any stain is important. Usually, green water, stained water is going to be warmer water. So again, you wanna look at the water when you're coming out of your port to see what the water's doing. Now, in front of a creek, <coughs> You're going to see a lot of stain, especially if there's runoff, right? We've had a mild winter, not a lot of snow. Unless we get a lot of rain, there's probably not going to be a ton of runoff, so you may not see an, an outflow of, of colored water, but that's why you see it around the creek. And if the wind is blowing so <coughs> out of the west, it's potentially going to push that water to the east of the creek, and that's going to, that's going to hold fish. This website, uh, if you guys aren't familiar, it's basically if you Google Modus Lake Ontario, it's satellite imagery of the lake taking at different times of the day, okay? Um, what's really good about this is if you're really unfamiliar with what the lake is doing, if you look at this, and again, it's stuck on the wood stream, you can see this is the Niagara, you see this, this color, this is all green water here, okay? There's some green water here as well. So it's a good idea to get on your phone and Google that see where the water might be, see what the area of your lake that you're fishing, if it, if it has any color, but it's a great, uh, it's a great uh, website to use, especially in the summer too. You transition to salmon, it's great to see where the water's coming from. Obviously it always comes by the Ni Niagara and then Oak Orchard, but. Same uh, website again? Yeah, it's right on the, on the top there, but it's uh, coastwatch.glerl. <coughs> dot n o a a dot gov modus but again if you just google lake ontario modus uh, it will come up for you is Ganae power plant still running are they still pushing warm water well you can't they it, it, that's a great question i mean i, should, I don't want to get off topic here but that area Pulteneyville, bear creek Ganae, probably is the mecca for brown trout no doubt about it. You can't fish in the plume, you know, it's it's buoyed out, but you can go around it, yes. Okay. And if we have time at the end, I can talk to you about that. I fished that area a lot with another charter captain, and there's some tricks to working that whole area that hold a ton of fish. That's a great question. Okay, <clears throat> our techniques. So a couple things that we do in combination with the spoons that kind of works the whole package together, all right? And one of the mistakes that we make, and you know, again, back in the day, I, I made a similar state, mistake as, you know, large swivels, you know, heavy line, you want, you know, you don't want to lose any fish. It's the complete opposite. You want to use as small a swivel as possible, okay? Uh, the image on the right's a torpedo swivel, that's a number zero. I actually like them smaller than that. In the spring, I use a very, very tiny, lightweight swivel, okay? It's probably 30 pound, but it's really, really small, okay? And the reason for that is you want the spoon to have as natural movement in the water as possible. It's very, very important that you do that, okay? The swivel itself wants to have a nice bend in it, nice radius, like you see in the middle of the check mark. Okay, again, that lure wants to be able to move up and down and flutter. If you use a swivel that comes to a point, it's restricting the movement of the spoon. Okay, so it's important that you find a swivel that has a nice bend in it and as small as possible. Okay. We're using very, very light line, um, you know, eight to 12 pound test. Um, I use, and this is a, a typical setup for me, this 
this is, goes back to what I mentioned earlier about saving money. That you know, if you can afford to have brown trout rods and salmon rods, that's awesome. But it can get very expensive. I use the same rod for both. Okay, this is a downrigger rod. I use this for brown trout. And the only thing I do is I have backers, 25 pound backer, and in the spring I put 12 pound leader on. All right, and then come. I'll use this for salmon until June, middle of June, and then when the fish start getting heavy, I'll just switch up a 20 pound uh, toracarbon. But again, just a typical eight foot six inch rod, dial reel, they work great. So again, don't feel like you have to have a brown trout set up, you know, in a small limit set up. How much 12 foot or 12 pound do you put on? Oh, we're gonna get to that shortly, it's a great question. Um, oh, it says it right there actually. So I use 25 to 30 feet, and here's the reason why. If the line gets chafed towards the end, you cut off a foot or six inches, you keep going. If you use an eight to 10 foot leader, then the problem is now you're retying all the time. So I like to put 25 to 30 feet of fluorocarbon leader. Plus, as they say, fluorocarbon leader is invisible in the water. And so if you're fishing browns in very shallow water, you just want that lure to show and not, and not the line. Okay, typical trolling spread for brown trout. Okay, this image here shows inline planer boards, which there's nothing wrong with them, they work very well. I particularly don't. I use uh, large boards, they're outer boats, I really like them. Um, but the concept is exactly the same, all right? So you have, in this particular pattern, you have a V pattern, which is your outside lines are further out, and then your insides go closer. You don't have to do that. The length of leader or line out in the water is gonna depend on the water you're fishing. So if it's gin clear, outside of staying home and going to breakfast, you may wanna run those leads much longer, 125 feet, 120 feet, okay? If the, if the water's more stained, a little bit muddy, you can, you can shorten them up, all right? But that's just the typical layout. Now, the one thing you'll, see, you'll notice here, it's important, is on the outside line, okay, so I'm running my board, got my board out here and I've got my lines attached to it. The outside one, okay, is always gonna be in the rod holder closest to the helm, all right? The middle one is in the middle and then the one closest to the boat here is gonna be closest to the back of the boat. Reason for that is if the fish gets bit, this comes, you don't want these lines to start to tank. So it's important you always do that. Now, if the fish bites, let's say the outside one gets bit, you're moving these rods further back and you're running them away from the boat. Again, you don't want the fish you're fighting to get tangled in those lines. The releases you see there, um, again, there's plenty of releases. For years I used the um, shout fitter ones, you know, the little plastic, they, they're orange and green. They stay on your planer board line, which are great. They're a little bit light. Um, and so sometimes they don't slide good, especially on mono line. I have mono planer board uh, line. Mm -hmm. So you can add weight to them by putting a small, I think it's an 832 screw with a nut inside the release, and that'll help them slide down. What's great about them is they stay on the line, right? So they slide down if you pick them, but you don't have to worry about taking them on and off. Um, the problem that I had is, you know, being out in the sun all the time, over a couple years, they started to dry rot. So I replaced them with these Scotties. These are called Scotty Mini Power Grip Releases. They're bright, they work really, really well, they're relatively inexpensive, um, but those are the releases that I use. But again, use what's most comfortable for you. Um, I just happen to like these because again, a lot of it is the expense um, and they work really, really well and they're adjustable. So, um, the is a, what we call a weight rod, and we call a 10 foot diver rod. We're gonna talk about that shortly. You can use downriggers as well, it, do, it doesn't matter. This is my typical setup. Most times, unless I go out a little bit deeper offshore, uh, if the browns move out, I'll, I'll, I may run a downrigger, but we use what we call a weight rod and a 10 foot diver. So, you know, that's an eight rod spread. If I have less people on the boat, I may put, you know, two planer board, uh, real, uh, rods on each side, but I will always try to always run either two weight rods or a weight rod and that 10 foot diver. Okay, trolling rod setup. We talked about that a minute ago. Eight foot six inch rod, uh, something with a good backbone. 
Um, dial reels, they're great, uh, not super expensive, um, and they hold up. They're great for you know, salmon fish as well. Uh, 12 pound fluorocarbon leader, uh, 25 to 30 feet, as we discussed. Um, the leader that we've been using, I have it here, I'll show you. is I've been using the Seagar Red Label, okay? The, I used to use Invisix, and it's great, but Red Label is less, like half the price, and it works just as good. Literally no difference, okay? So if you can find the Seagar Red Label in 12 or 20 pounds, this is a 20, 20 pound box that I use in the summer, um, it's a great floor card. It, it works totally fine. So again, fishing on a little bit of a budget, this is a great, uh, this is a great line to use. Um, we use a quarter ounce split shot if needed, okay? So what that means is, in some cases, with the spoons, we get to that point, they're a little bit lighter, okay? And so if the water's dead calm, sometimes the lure doesn't have really good action, end up floating on the top. Plus, if you're in maybe six to eight feet of water and you wanna get down a couple more feet, you put a split shot, quarter split shot on the line, and you can place that four to five feet after the spoon. Now what some guys do is they'll leave it on the rod, say five feet, and that way if they've got a fish, if they've got room, they don't have to take the split shot off. You can leave it on, it doesn't matter. So four to five feet, put a split shot on there. Not all cases, but if you want to, it helps get the lure down uh, in the water a little bit. That's that's also a good, a good thing to do. And then the uh, line counter reel. So the thing with the line counter reel is they're great to have, you know, again, you look at it, you set your zero, I want to go out 100 feet. When I started, I was using the predecessor to these, which was the old Iowa uh, level lines, and, you know, there's no line counter on it. So, take your line, let the level line go one pass, measure how much line came out your rod fit. It's 10 feet, you want to go 100 feet, 10 passes. It's very simple. It's going to catch fish just as well as that reel. It's again, it's a, it's a relative thing. So if you don't have a line counter reel, it's okay. You can still catch fish. Again, just measure out one pass, just one across. How much line came out? If you want to go, like I said, it's 10 feet. Like those dials were 10 feet. I wanted to go out 100 feet. I would just watch, I would do 10 passes. So um, great way to catch fish again without having to worry about having a line counter. Okay, our weight rod setup. So, same rod, okay, eight foot six inch rod. We're gonna use, uh, I like to use uh, an XL or a standard warrior, which would be equivalent, you know, just a, a regular, not a mag, but the one smaller than that, or one of the warrior XLs. We got 40 to 45 feet of line out, put a split shot or two, and let an additional 40 to 45 feet, okay? If you wanna go 70 feet behind the boat, it's 35 and 35. Okay, and you're gonna place it in a horizontal rod holder just like you would a dipsy dive. So it's kind of cool, you're in the spring, you're on the shoreline, you've got a rod set out, and when that red weight rod gets bent, that rod tip folds over. I mean, it's, it's awesome. It's just like, it's like a dipsy dip in shallow water. Okay, what we call a 10-foot diver. Um, this is a Chinook diver. I think they're actually here. Um, it's, just set up right here, okay? Now you same rod, okay? This is a, uh, a number one. I have it set on the furthest weight to the outside, okay? And I have about eight foot of leader on here, all right? You wanna use about the length of what your rod is, okay? So if it's an eight foot, six inch rod, you're gonna have about eight feet of leader, okay? And literally what you're gonna do is you're gonna hook your spoon on here Hook this to your rod, just like you do a dipsy diver, and let it out roughly 10 feet. That's why we call it the 10-foot diver. It's just something that we made up. Brown trout are not boat shy, okay? In a lot of cases, you'll see the dipsy in the water, and it'll get them. Brown trout are not afraid to prop wash. Uh, there's a very well-known charter captain out of Rochester by the name of Sam. He puts his downrigger his center downrigger right behind his boat 
and puts his little right in the prop wash, and that's probably his most productive rig in the spring. So don't be concerned that you're you know too close to the boat when it comes when it comes to that. This uh, well, again, ten foot diver setup is probably I don't know. It's probably the most exciting thing since we started using this uh, just a few years ago. So uh, again, it's a great way to get rod in the water. Again, you can use a downrigger. It's, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you don't have downriggers, or you know, if you take them off or not on your boat, whatever, the ten foot diver is a uh, is a great way to to catch fish. Okay. Let's go back. So our lure selection. All right. Uh, why warrior spoons? Well, they're extremely speed tolerant. Okay, they control in very shallow water because you know they don't have a lip, so they're not diving. They've got phenomenal action. They have two flutter spoons. One is their standard. One is their XL. The XL, as you see, is three and three quarter inches long. The standard flutter is three and three eighths inch long. Okay, um, the action on them is incredible. The bend in these spoons. I mean, you don't have to tune them, but if you notice there, you can see there's quite a bend in there, all right? These, these work really, really well. Now, why I like them for, to stick baits is because I just think that they're more versatile, all right? Um, you know, somebody asks, well, can I run stick baits on one side and spoons on the other? And you certainly can, and a lot of guys do. The problem is if you're in shallow water, they're on your outside line. Let's say your, your stick baits are on your outside and you turn, you're catching fish now those have a potential of getting hung up because they're because they're diving okay the other thing is with the speed is the stick bait needs the wobble right it wants to show an injured fish so it wants to move if you speed up three miles an hour which you can catch browns going three miles an hour now the it's going to track straight it's not really going to move like it should a spoon is very speed tolerant, so you can go very slow, get a nice wobble. You can speed up, and you'll still get you'll still get that action. Okay, so let me just talk about conditions here a little bit. You know, clear water, it's challenging, no doubt about it. You know. Uh, we're always looking for color when we're, we're brown trout fishing. You know, we want it to rain, we want some runoff, we don't want it super muddy, but you can still catch fish in clear water, okay? And that kind of goes back to why we start shallow. So you come out of the creek, oh man, it's, it's gonna be a great day, there's you know, no wind, it's beautiful, and you go out and the water's gin clear, and you can see all the way to the bottom, like, oh, now do we do? Before the sun really, really comes up, there's still fish in that shallow water, okay? Um, so again, run longer leads, and you want to use, you know, more of a natural bait. Your black and silvers, maybe a little bit of light green. These are some of the names. I have these labeled. You know, feel free to look at these later. Um, you know, rod father, black pearl. Uh, you know, green spoiler. They've got a lot of natural color in it. Okay, you can um, the, the brown goby. That's another one that's believe on this pad here. Um, really good for clear water. Also, if you notice, these spoons are thin and they're long, okay? Now, I know that smelt isn't around like it used to be. I know, I think around the Niagara, it's starting to come around, but it really looks like a smelt, okay? So the fish, there's not a lot of hell lives in April. There's goby, a ton of goby, and there's smelt every, every now and again. So using these spoons, having that, you know, long, narrow shape kind of emulates a smelt. Um, but, you know, again, anything natural color. Okay, um, early in the morning, you might be able to get away with a white. Uh, white pearl, for example, is really good early in the morning. But, you know, as that sun comes up and you're really starting to see the bottom, you're like, well, there's no fish here. You maybe haven't gotten bit, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever. You can step out. You know, don't, you know, sometimes, you know, I do it too, you get so focused. Well, I know there's fish in here, you know, they're going to be in here. Step out. If you're in 5 to 10, work to 10 to 15. Okay, and then maybe what you're gonna do is you're gonna drop your, your maybe you put your downrigger down or you put your, your 10 foot diver, maybe you let a, a few more feet of line out. So um, it, it, that you can catch fish in clear water, you just have to, you have to be able to react and adjust when that happens. Um, ideal, the stained water, we talked about that, the greens and yellows, uh, white pearl, uh, 
phenomenal spoon, a great, uh, you know, all-conditioned spoon. That's this one right here, okay? Um, Nonfiction. This is one of my favorites. I love this spoon. I run it all the time. Catches fish, does really, really great. Lemon ice, um, our confusion, copper confusion, another real good spoon in when the stain conditions. Um, Goldville Crusher, another good one. Well, I can't, I mean, they're all, they're all really good for that light stain water. You want to use something green, yellow. If the water is really muddy, you got to go as bright as you can because you want the fish to see the lure. So anything that's, you know, orange or obnoxious will be helpful to you in, in the muddy water. Excuse me, uh, Super Giordo. Where's my Super Giordo? That's, uh, Oh, it's right there. Super Giordo. Phenomenal spoon. Now this one's been, it's caught some fish. But this spoon works really, really well. And I want to say something about this particular color. It's a little bit pinkish and some orange. This color in the spring in shallow water will catch salmon. It will catch salmon. I have found the last probably four to five years of fishing um, near Bald Eagle Marina, where it's where we're from, that will catch a kid on a bright colored spoon like that. The salmon like those bright colored spoons. So if you're anxious to catch a king or if you heard, oh, some guy, you know, that's fishing just caught a king, put a bright yellow orange, like Wicked Witch, here's another one. Um, something very, very similar to that, and that will, that will catch salmon. Okay. All right, so our tips for success. Again, attention to detail, okay? Don't overlook <coughs> the small things. Temperature, super important. Two degrees, one degree, is going to make a huge difference. Look at your shoreline. Make sure you're following those points. Work those coats. Okay, very important to pay close attention to that. Your speed, super important. Okay, so I use, I have, uh, you know, my fish finder. I have uh, surface speed, and then I have the autopilot with my surface speed on there. And I, I pay attention to both. Okay, so ideally for me, my boat, and it'll be different for you, for your boats as well is 2.4 knots to 2.6 knots, okay? That's kind of where I start. If I know there's fish there and I'm not getting bit, you know, the color, everything looks good, conditions are good, temperature's good, I may just adjust that, back it down. Two tenths of a mile an hour is gonna make a difference. It will make a difference, okay? So if you make that adjustment and you get bit, note where that speed was at, super important. The other thing, too, is if, if you're working coves or you're even turning, okay, for example, and I'm sure this has happened to you guys, you turn, you're outside. I mean, when we turn, you know, I've got to spread out. My boat's not real wide, so I've got to take wide turns, all right? My outside lines are ripping. I'm going three and a half, four miles an hour on the surface, and my lures are ripping, and boom, you get bent, okay? Well, maybe they want it a little bit faster. So now when I straighten out, maybe I'll speed my boat up a little bit, okay? If you get bent... Note that, repeat it. It's very, very important. You have to repeat everything that you see. If you're, you're at 100 feet and you, and, you get a, and you get a bit, you get a bite, let it out to 100 feet, okay? This is gonna sound crazy, but let's say it's 97 feet. Put it out 97 feet. It's, it's the same with salmon fishing. I mean, it's relative. The number is the number. The trick is to repeat it. If you repeat it, you're going to get more bites, okay? If the fish aren't biting, we talked about this earlier, it's okay to adjust. Again, you know, it gets hyper-focused on, you know, I know there's fish here. But if for some reason, you know, the sun comes up and they start to shut down, move out a little bit, okay? Um, if you're in clear water, if you move out a little bit, now the fish might be down a little bit deeper, that's when you're gonna maybe use your lead cores, okay? Uh, two color lead cores, great. Three color lead core, all right? Anything to help you get the lure down and the water column will help, all right? If the water is really muddy, move out a little bit, 
You know, sometimes the shoreline is a ton of mud. If you see brown to green, you want to work that edge. Okay, that's where you're going to get your bites. Okay, you can get bit in muddy water. It's challenging, but if you find that transition and where that mud starts to clear up, that's the area you want to target. So, you know, I, I talk a lot about shoreline fishing, but it doesn't mean that you're not going to end up in 15 to 20 feet of water. It's, it's totally, it totally can happen. How are we doing on time, Sean? Yeah, there'll be plenty of time. It's 1.30. 1.30, okay. So we got a few minutes for question and answers. We could go back through this, but are there any questions? Yes, sir. So we're, <clears throat> when you're in close, and on that uh, display, you said they're like 100 foot back, with a, with a little split shot. You said boats, boats aren't scaring fish. Why are you not for the like the planer board guy, the inline? Why are you not like, running like 10, one ounce, 10? To get it down, you know, so you don't have so much line out so we can turn, mm -hmm. I mean, would that sound a little better? Or? Yes, you can, you can. Now what you have to be careful of doing that is making sure, you know, with inlines it's tough because on a big board, you yeah. can really spread them out, right? right? I mean, if I let my boards all yeah. the way out, yeah. now you can separate them, less room for error. I'm a very keep it simple, stupid person. I don't like to have things cluttered in my head. That's why I use the big boards. Yeah. You could do that with the inlines. Just to be honest with you, I don't run them a lot unless it's out in the summer for like with coppers. So I don't have a lot of experience to tell you, hey, you know, do this specifically. Strictly a big board person. Yeah. Um, just because again, my boat's a little bit smaller and it allows me that room to separate. Because you're basically targeting three to five feet, right? Yes. And that's so yes. as long as you're there, that board's not going to scare that fish, correct? No, no, the board will not scare the fish. I mean, no. honest to goodness, you know, that 10-foot diver or even the downrigger in the prop wash, I had an outboard, so, yeah. you know, it's difficult for me to put a rigger in the prop wash, but with that 10-foot diver, no exaggeration, it's almost like bass flipping. When that rod goes, you lift, you reel one time, and the brown is in the boat. I mean, they're that close. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I know you're shallow. You run your probe in the spring? No. Great question. Uh, I use the surface temperature. So, again, there's no temperature breaks, right? Mm -hmm. The water's the water, and usually it's 37 degrees. Same thing with speed, right? I, if To put the probe in there, the chances of me being, the speed being off five foot down in that shallow water in the spring is probably not likely. So, I do not run my probe, but I do pay attention to the surface speed. Okay, now again, if we go out, you know, 15, 20 feet, you know, and we're fishing out a little bit deeper later in May, if the browns are starting to move out, then if I put a rigger down, I'll put, you know, I'll put my speed and temp sensor down. You're going by speed over ground and GPS, you mean, or you're, yes. you got a yeah. paddle in the water? Uh, there's a, no, it's speed over ground with GPS speed, okay. yeah, yeah. No, there's no paddle in the water, not on the, the new fish finder that I have, it's off of, off of GPS. So that's why I look at both, but primarily I focus on my, um, my autopilot because that's the one I'm paying attention to, to the most and again that 2.4 <coughs> to 2.6 is my ideal start range but again I'll speed up and slow down if I have to to get to get a bite. Guys if you you look at this program and lose spelled it out that you know that's a brown trout spread but there are years that, that that's the salmon program too like the same stuff it works we fished down in Wilson one year and we literally, for the tournament, right, we, we ran our brown trout spread for a week. And we fished 10 to 15 foot of water for a week. And we caught 400 browns. And every 10 or 15 browns we caught, we pull a nice king out of it. So the kings are in there. Um, especially early, early, like Lewis talking, you know, you look in that temperature break, the kings are in there. If there's bait there, there's browns there, there's kings there. We've caught lake trout in six foot of water. Lake Trout, Steelhead, you know. Um, the thing too, and Sean brought it up, is that the spoons aren't just for brown trout. So I use these in the summer. Steelhead, salmon. Um, Sean says this a lot, middle of the afternoon, one, two o'clock. Sometimes the fish just wants a snack. He doesn't want a big, big meal. These are a great snack. Um, 
the, this copper confusion is, is ridiculous in the summer. It's great, again, great for steelhead, great for salmon, but you can run these lures spring and summer without a question. And, and in the catalog, if you look, most of the colors are all the way through the sizes, right? So whether it's a flutter, a flutter XL, a standard, or a mag, you should be able to get the color in any of the size spoons. So it's not that I put these away when we're done fishing for browns. So do you rarely run sticks or you'll switch over sometimes? <laughs> are sticks a lot on my boat, Sean? <laughs> I have to bring them from my stuff. Yeah. I, <laughs> listen, yeah. here's the thing about all that. I, I do have stick baits in my boat, right? So I primarily run spoons. Uh, look, I'm not paid by Warrior. Sean will test to that. I'm just a consumer that I really love his product. And Mike is a great guy and he's super supportive. But you want to catch fish. So the sticks are there in case, no, no doubt about it, but primarily, I mean, I had a stick for a while, I was using um, the Bay Rats, yeah. thought they were great, but the problem with the Bay Rat, again, my opinion, my boat, speed. I couldn't run, you know, put a Bay Rat, say on a weight rod or the 10 foot diver, and it's not tracking right when my spoons are. So it's, it was really tough, and I, I stopped using those like three years ago. I've got a whole bunch that I very rarely ever put in the water. And here's the other thing too about spoons, I wanted to bring this up. Spoons have a single treble hook. Stick baits have three treble hooks. And it's a pain in the absolute butt to try to get a fish out of a net with all the hooks stuck in the gosh darn thing. Now, I run charters, so you know you, you want to get the fish in the cooler or pitcher and release, and you want to get your rod and the back in the water and to deal with the hooks, it's a pain, it's just a pain in the neck. This is my opinion. It's a big pain in the neck. So. Any other questions? Well, I really appreciate your time. I hope it was informational at some point. You picked up a couple of a little tricks that we do. Feel free, we've got some time to, to look at the lure pads. Please grab a catalog. Again, there's 20% coupons in there. And if we run out, like I said, if you call, they will uh, just let them know you're at the seminar. And so, um, exactly. they'll take care of you. I'm going to do the geography. How far away from the whole time? How far away from the whole
You know you're not going to go to Well, that's the other thing, too, because we all know that, you know, like, you got to be a fish. That can be afraid to change. It is work, right? Fish and six water, you got to bring them all in. So, we caught all kinds of things and all kinds of problems, and we were yelling to the guys in the marina. That's how far we went. I change up. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I just don't want to. Yeah, 
but but they're still uh, so so uh, 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 what about they swap me yeah right yeah. 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 yeah what about yeah. 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 the Genesee River what about that yeah 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 I used to, in the summer, I used to wade in there. It was 95 degrees at the top of the year. And catch small hop bass. That was a good time, man. Yeah, it was. 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 Hey, we get to a whole other conversation. Yeah. No more, you have yeah. a yeah. boat. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that'll never happen. Right. Right. So we can plug them in, you'll say, yeah, yeah, plug them in because you don't have enough time. That'll never happen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So that's why we work. Because I ended up getting a.